Welcome to today's Lunch and Learn. Accuracy, why I hate that term by McGee Young. Pop quiz for the audience. In, in which of these diagrams are the dots that are represented more uh, accurate? Is it, I mean, it's a term on what you're trying to do? Nope, there's a there's an answer. It's a it's a black and white answer. You're right or you're wrong. We're assuming the target is what you want to hit, right? <laughs> yes. Like that's yeah. the goal. So I think everyone pointed at at pointed left, meaning to point right, because we're all mirror imaged. <laughs> that's fair. So the target um the target on the right hand side is the one that illustrates accuracy, right? I said the other one just to be counter. <laughs> You're wrong. <laughs> Sometimes you are. No, nope, no nope points. Now, now, um, which one is which one is more precise? Which and, and which which of these are the dots more precise? Both same. 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 Actually, I think the ones in the bullseye are closer together. <laughs> Yeah, they're roughly the same, but probably the bullseye is slightly better. Okay, next slide. This is gonna. This is this one's gonna be fun. Now, which ones of the which one, the left or the right here, is more accurate? Malformed question. Error minus three. Anybody have an answer? I mean, what? No. There's not enough information to determine. Yeah, that. you can't figure it out. Why not? What is accuracy? What's the basis of accuracy? Because you don't know the right answer. What's the right answer? Exactly. So, <laughs> which one's more precise? What's the question? Like, what do you? <laughs> which one's more accurate, the left or the right? We don't have a way to judge. Like, we don't know. All right, and which one's more precise? They look the same. So they're both, so, so precision is, is, is something that you can actually judge in this case, but accuracy is something that you cannot, All right? So accuracy, given a set of data points, this is straight from Wikipedia, that's how lazy I was. Given a set of data points from repeated measurements of the same quantity, the set can be said to be precise if the values are close to each other. Well, the set, to, the set can, said, can be said to be accurate if their average is close to the true value of the quantity being measured. The true value. So, got, so we don't have a true value here uh, in the previous one is what you guys are saying here. And that's why there's no, there's no accuracy. So let's talk about this for a second. What is the true value being measured? In our case, we're thinking about buildings and energy efficiency. So uh, when we're talking about accuracy um, in, in a model, perhaps, or a savings calculation, perhaps, uh, are we, A, uh, explaining all of the causes of changes in energy consumption in a building? So is that what is that what is that what being accurate means? B, uh, explaining all of the changes in consumption that are attributable to the measures installed. I don't know what C is. Oh yeah, does and then so the question is. Does accuracy include changes in consumption that followed an intervention but were only indirectly related, like a rebound effect? So this would be like number two, part B. Is accuracy explaining all the changes, changes in consumption in the first place, but what about indirect changes in consumption? Or is it just number one? Or is it none of the above? I, I throw it out to you all. Wait, is, sorry, is number one uh, explaining all of the changes regardless of cause? All of the causes of changes. That's a totally different animal. Yes. 
but maybe that's what we're looking for when we're looking for accuracy. I mean, typically in the industry, the second one is taken as the goal. Um, but within pay for performance and in mech, um, it might be laudable to have that goal, but at the same time, it might not, the goal might change itself because if we're really gearing for energy efficiency and demand flexibility to be used as grid resources, then the overall change in consumption matters. And that's what AB802 calls out, you know, the overall change in consumption. It doesn't say the overall change in consumption attributable to the measures. Um, so I don't know that there's a definitive answer, but in terms of how you might think about it, uh, I think the second one is typically how energy efficiency has been discussed, but I'm not sure that that's, that that's the way that we should think about it anymore. Is that a vote for number one, number two, or number three? Well, uh, it's not a vote for any of them. I think that you can, it, but it's a, the illustration is a good one that, you know, you should ask up front. I mean, maybe you have an opinion on, on which one this, on, maybe there is a definitive answer. Oh, it's, it's my lunch and learn. I'm, this is the Socratic method of yeah. teaching where I get, I get to ask the questions. Mm -hmm. Does anybody else have a vote for one, two, or three? I vote three. Why? Um, I think if you don't take into account the rebound effect, you're only getting a partial view of efficiency. And I think the rebound effect is caused by the fact that energy becomes cheaper. So it's a result of the intervention, so it should be included. But maybe that's anchoring too much on what I think should be happening as opposed to what true value means. Anybody else, anybody else have a vote? Can you guys hear me? Yes. All right. Uh, it depends on your perspective. I, I, I tend to agree with Adam that if you're, if you're trying to figure out things like uh, cost effectiveness of the dollars that you're spending, then you care about attributing to attributing energy savings to what you're actually doing. Uh, if things are just happening naturally in the market, you, you don't want to take that into account in your uh, calculations. Otherwise, in general, we think uh, our, our hypothesis is that if you capture enough of the factors that cause changes in energy consumption, so that first point, uh, and the random variation kind of washes out in a large enough sample of buildings and then you should be getting to the right answer so it's uh, i think it depends on your perspective <laughs> i would also say that two and three is a is a false dichotomy right the the distinction between indirect relationship is only meaningful in the sense that if you're doing an engineering calculation of impact then indirect relationship is a separate category of thing but from the perspective, like attributable and indirect are not two different things in my opinion, right? If you do a thing to a building and some stuff happens to the motor and then some other stuff happens to behavior, they're both attributable to the motor change, right? If like, if that intervention caused both those things, all that ripple effect, um, the fact that some people hate the building and now they go and spend their lunch hour in a different building and we cause more energy use over there, like from a, like if we want to have an attribution conversation, all that stuff should count. Whether it's measurable or modelable is a, is a separate issue. The separate category, in my opinion, the non-attributable category is it just happens that at the same time, some other crazy stuff started happening and, and you know someone else moved into the building. Those are like exogenous changes that might get swept up in there. Those are unattributable changes. Like that's fair to try to exclude from the true value. But indirect versus direct is, is in the eye of the beholder. I don't, I don't see that as useful. So I think that's a good, that's a good segue. Uh, Cause we, so, so uh, what we need here is some, some way to know like, what is the ground truth against which we're like, when we go back to here, uh, here, here, we, we, this gives us a ground truth, right? To say like, 
we know the one on the right is accurate and the one on the left is not accurate. So in here, we don't have a ground truth. So we have no opinion as to whether, which of these is more accurate than the other. So uh, here we, we also maybe don't have a ground truth. So what would uh, it look like? Um, so let's, let's think about that first, that first use case. So uh, if you have a, a, a building's energy use uh, was perfectly correlated with changes in weather. So you have an R squared of, of 1.0. Um, if your model estimated changes in energy use perfectly, uh, would you, so that, which is to say like it took weather and um, was able to match it up on a one, one by one basis, uh, would you call this an accurate model? So to the extent that you're building, changes its energy use 100% consistently with changes in weather. And your model accurately captures that change. So it, it says, yep, there's another degree day. It looks like the building's energy use went up by the exact amount that we predicted uh, based on that degree day. Is this a perfectly accurate model? No. Why not? Well, the first question I'd ask is, well, what are, how is that R square calculated? So is it just using the data that was, uh, that was used to train the model? And in that case, I, c I can get you an R square, square of one for any data. <laughs> yep. Uh, and even if it were, say, you know, you did some out of sample testing or whatever, uh, Having this quote unquote perfect R squared just tells you that g given these uh, input variables, you're able to predict output variables within a certain range accurately. If you step outside that for a second, if you have a slightly hotter year, slightly colder year, then you could be way off. So there's, uh, so there's two things here. Uh, how are you calculating your error metrics and what's, what kind of range are you talking about with regards to your data? Is it capturing what, what you're actually gonna be predicting or no? I guess uh, there's also, um, if you go back to the previous slide, since we didn't settle on an answer, and I think of that very first bullet, uh, certainly there's not enough information just given those two statements on the next slide to explain all of the causes of changes in energy consumption in a building. Um, potentially you, you know, if this is a model that is looking to capture energy savings and the R squared is perfect and, you know, at 1.0, uh, but you did two or three measures, how would you attribute between those measures given the model? And this has been a, criticism of billing analysis for years, which is simply to say that, well, if all you're doing is a billing analysis, you don't get information on the why. You don't get the measure level attribution. And a lot of deemed savings analyses pointed to that as a point of defense for doing a really shitty impact evaluation that gave you no useful information whatsoever. But hey, they told you everything at a measure level, so take it or leave it. Uh, so I think that this is sometimes a weakness of billing analyses, but I also think it's overstated. And the folks who tend to have that line of argument also don't understand all of the insights you can get from AMI data. Um, so the answer lies somewhere in between. Um, you know, the, the assumption that all you're going to get out of a billing analysis is the final savings value and you get zero other information is not an, is not a, a reasonable statement. Um, but it's certainly the R squared example certainly doesn't capture accuracy in the way that that first bullet would employ. So, uh, what makes a, what makes a model inaccurate then? I mean, according, according to this de definition, it's that 
you know, it's not. Bias? Not capturing the, the it, inaccuracy means that it's, it's not capturing the causes of change. Well, this, this is a really, this is a really interesting question, especially following this whole discussion, because I think we've all just agreed that if a model has a perfect fit, that that may or may not be because the model is quote unquote accurate. But what if a model sucks? Like it just doesn't, it doesn't have any predictive capability whatsoever, right? Now, is that an inaccurate model? That, that's a different question. And like in my mind, the answer is yes, it's an inaccurate model. If, if it just does a crappy job all the time, I would say it's an inaccurate model. Crappy job relative to, to what? Well, if, if you know the answer, again, all of this is rooted uh, in- So what does the ground truth look like then? <laughs> the meter data, I think, is it would be like, so- But there is no meter data, there is there's no like, uh, you know, we, we're missing the bullseye here because we don't know like what you would have used if you hadn't have done the thing. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, the, the inaccuracy question, it seems like this is logically disproving an assertion with data. No, no set of examples will prove that something is true, but one counter example will prove that it's false, right? From, from a logical perspective, right? You can't, you can't prove logic just by giving a whole bunch of examples because it's it's a limited set, right? But if you be able to reject the null hypothesis, exactly, right? Or not be able to reject the null. I don't know one of those things. Right, right, yeah, yeah, right. We failed to we failed to reject the null hypothesis. Yeah. Therefore, we don't yet know that our our hypothesis is wrong. <laughs> but one one you know one counterexample and boom, you're done. So I think inaccurate models are possible to find. Accurate models are sort of impossible to prove. And so you get to a place where you're like, well. We've, we've failed to prove that this model is inaccurate to a certain level. Like we've given it sample tests. It's got a nice healthy data set. Like we don't just have two points, you know, and we've got a nice R, R squared with a two point. Like that's obviously crap. But inaccurate um, in the sense of ex explaining the, the causes of changes in energy consumption in a building or the measure uh, related to the measures or related to all, uh, you know, effects that might be observed. This, this is where we're, we're sort of like, I'm not sure if these are two different things or not. I've been, I've been struggling with accuracy in this slide is describing the measurement of change relative to the baseline model. And then in the next slide, we're talking about accuracy of the model seemingly in a vacuum, right? So, mm -hmm. so it's kind of, kind of two different things, but I think in a sense, they're, they're one thing because the way you're posing the question now, now we're adding some context around accuracy, which is to say, does it capture all the changes in the building except the one that we want to measure? All the causes of change except that one we want to measure. And so we've got, in the first slide, we're sort of defining what's in and out of bounds. And in the second slide, we're saying, how well do we do at distinguishing between those? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, let me get to the last slide then. How can we get better accuracy? Maybe we want better accuracy. Maybe this is a thing. So. Um, Perhaps we could we could still continue to focus on weather, uh, but change how the model interacts. So we could we could, for example, move to degree hours instead of degree days, and get a more accurate uh, relationship between changes in temperature and changes in energy use. That um, it's it seems uh, at least verbally to make sense, um, if maybe not uh, intellectually. Uh, we could. Um, focus on other variables that might explain changes in energy use, uh, like getting better baselines. So having like a, an occupancy proxy, for example, a day of the week um, term, for example, or, or some production values, for example, uh, might, might be helpful. Um, we, could, we could close our eyes and hope for the best. Um, so uh, this is what I would describe the monthly fixed effects model as doing, which is like, we don't really know what's going on, but we're just going to say something happens differently in each of the months of the year and, and just leave it at that. Um, uh, or uh, we could reject the premise of the question and accuracy is not the problem here. Subjectivity is the problem. And so this is, you know, where I sort of circle back around. The real issue here is that if you have a particular way of approaching a, a, a question like this, which is like, 
what are the savings, um, you're going to get, you know what you know with the, with respect to the you know accuracy and for however it's problematic is problematic, and that's a very different problem than subjectivity, which is that I'm going to do my own model and my own interpretations of things and come up with an answer that you may or may not agree with or or be able to replicate or even you know understand how I got uh, that answer in the first place. And I think as we're having these conversations with folks, you know, when we when somebody says accuracy, the, the questions that, we, you know, what we need to say is, what do you mean by that? And what are we really trying to solve for here? Uh, and the and the really the bigger thing that we're trying to solve for is the fact that too much of this of, of M and V is subjective and based on the personal preferences of the person who's doing the analysis. And that's what, you know, ultimately Caltrack is trying to solve. Um, we have to keep in mind that the the bigger the bigger problem here, the the barrier to the markets, is um, that the willy nilliness of of M and V as it has preceded us, and the bigger contribution we've made is to is to standardize that and to keep it consistent for folks.